Good evening. My name is Pastor Gil Endo, and we're about to have a study in inductive reading using the book of John. And the, today's lesson is going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be the reason for this study. The second part, we're going to use inductive reading uh, as we open the first chapter of John. Before we start, let's open in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and for eager souls who want to learn the scriptures. But it's not just for head knowledge. It's to impart to others. Help us, Lord, to be effective witnesses. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen. I have copies here of today's lesson, if you'd like to pass these around. Have you ever considered becoming a missionary? Uh, I, I've always wondered whether whether I could handle being a missionary, then I realized I only speak English. Well, that kind of ended it. Well, if you were a missionary, where would you begin teaching the Bible? What book would you start them in? Now, uh, It doesn't matter where you start, because God will honor his word. You can begin in the book of Revelation. You can begin in Matthew chapter 1 and read them genealogies, and it might bless them. But wherever the Holy Spirit leads you, God will bless uh, your efforts to communicate the scriptures. But I want you to think strategically. Where would you begin teaching the Bible? Now, let's say you're in Papua New Guinea. A witch doctor or a cannibal has no knowledge of Jesus Christ. Okay? So you want to introduce Jesus Christ because our main purpose is to let them know that they are sinners, they cannot earn their salvation. The consequence for sin is death. But Jesus died on the cross so they could have eternal life. It's a free gift. How do you communicate that to them? Many people begin in the book of John. Can anybody quote the first verse of John? What does that mean to a cannibal? What does that mean to an American? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's code. I have no idea what you're talking about. Is John a good place to start? If you're reading it with them, maybe. If you tell them, hey, start reading here. He's going to get bored and put it away. I can't handle this. This is too, too religious. Okay. In, in the 1980s, now I'm going to tell you the reason why we're going to have this study. In the 1980s, the United States has been declared a mission field. Remember I asked you? Have you ever thought about being a missionary? I don't have to speak another language. The mission field is right outside. Okay? So, today, most Americans come, do not come from a Christian home. How many of you do not come from a Christian home? Okay, me too. This is a good percentage because 
A lot of you do. But if you go to walking down the streets, very few people come from a Christian home. Or they will say they're Christian because they go to church on Christmas and Easter. But they have no idea what the Bible is all about. Many people don't even know who Jesus is. It, you, you might be surprised to know that a lot of people think that Jesus Christ is a cuss word. That's the only way they've heard it. This is America? Things have changed since 1980s. So, imagine yourself being a person without any concept of Jesus. Is Jesus a real person to you? Not to the average American. They don't know. Maybe, oh yeah, I've heard about him. He was a great teacher, a philosopher. I don't know. Uh, they learn all about him in uh, Christian churches. See, they're, they're lost. So since the 1980s, church congregations have been diminishing quickly. Why were people leaving the church? Because, you've probably heard this before, it's very judgmental. Christians, I can look at a Christian and know he's judging me. I, I can't go across the street and go shopping there. There's this church across the street called Oxnard Nazarene. Those guys are pointing fingers at me. All I want to do is, you know, buy some gum. Ah, uh, but they think I'm going there to get drunk. People don't go inside to get drunk. But I feel judged. So I don't want to go to a church where they're going to tell me how bad I am. The average American listens to popular opinion before making any decisions. And where, does, where do they get their popular opinion? The internet, computer, computer games, music, television, movies, celebrities. All of these influence our culture. So whether it's true or not what, about Christians, I believe it because that's what everybody's saying. I can ask my friend. They know. No, they don't. They're as lost as you are. But I will ask my friend. That's where I get my opinion from somebody else who doesn't know. So, you know, I wonder how many likes or dislikes I'll get on this. <laughs> Wait a minute. Likes, dislikes, isn't that judgmental? And when they point the finger at a Christian and say they're judgmental, aren't they making a judgment? Well, that's not what my friends say. You see, the world is, is upside down now. But they've left the church because of what they assume they're going to hear in church. If you have a huge mega church and you see people leaving, how are you going to pay the rent? If you have a small church like this, a few people leaving, usually more come in. But still, how are you going to pay the rent? It's the mega churches that you have to be careful about because they've been into a lot of money and now that money is gone. So, what is happening? There was a movement called the Emerging Church Movement and they decided it is best not to preach judgment. 
and they don't talk about hell. God is love. That's true. Well, let's just teach. God is love. And you're not judged. We don't talk about judgment. Well, you know, God is also just. And if God is just, he has to judge sin. If I don't talk about hell, did you know that hell is mentioned three times more than heaven in the Bible? How much of scripture am I going to ignore just to get them in the door because the love of money is the root of all evil? Maybe I just need to get a smaller church. Well, that was one method of bringing people back. But in the 1980s, there was another movement called postmodernism. Postmodernism is the way we read the Bible. Now, if I read the Bible, it doesn't matter where I read it, if it, make, if it makes me feel good, that's the Holy Spirit touching my soul. So, I can make this passage say anything I want it to say if it makes me feel good, and then I have the... the Blessing of the Holy Spirit, because I feel good today. Have you ever had people twist your words to make it say something you didn't want to say? That's what postmodernism does when you read scripture. You make it say what God's not trying to say. But you feel good. So... I can read about David loving Jonathan and say, well, I'm gay. Hey, the Bible blesses me, just like David and Jonathan. That's not what it's saying. But this is how people are reading the Bible today. And so how many people out there really know what's in the Bible? Okay, this is the reason why we're having the lesson. God created a perfect world, but it's fallen. And we are living in the end times. And because we're in the end times, the church is falling away. Did you know that after one year of university, the average uh, student leaves church, 70% uh, of the students, freshmen, leave the church. How many generations can we continue like that before the church is empty? Okay. The United States is a mission field. We need to teach people how to read the scriptures in context, in historical context. And that's why this lesson is on how to read inductively. Now, inductive reading is to read the Bible in historical context. If I lived in the eighth decade, the eighth decade after the birth of Jesus, that's when John was written in the 80s. What would this mean to me if I'm reading it for the first time? I'm Jewish. I'm living in Israel. Well, maybe not. I'm living somewhere in a Roman Empire, and I'm reading the Gospel of John. What does it mean to me in that context, in my culture, in my understanding of government, the Roman Empire, Judaism? Once I understand that historical context and cultural context, then I will read it correctly. And if it makes sense to my life, I have an application. 
If it doesn't apply to my life, don't worry about it. Not everything is applicable to your life. You don't want it to be. Imagine reading about Assyria conquering Jerusalem and taking you away as a slave, putting a fish hook through your jaw and dragging you away. Well, I don't want experience like that just to understand this. It doesn't apply to me. But imagine being a Jew in Hitler's concentration camp. You can identify with that. You would understand it. If you're reading about Job and all his boils and sores and pain, hopefully you don't have to say from experience, I really feel that. But maybe with a contextual understanding of it now, later on you will go through that. And you'll say, oh, I need to read the book of Job again. That'll give me more encouragement to know that God will work things out. And once I've gone through that, how much more effective am I to talk to somebody who's going through it now? So some of the things don't apply now. They may never apply, or they might apply later on. A postmodernist is looking for an application now. I don't care what it meant to anybody else. It's got to make me feel good. That's postmodernism. That's wrong. So, now I want to encourage you to ask questions. If you have any questions, fill out the paper and somebody bring them up. Okay. And uh, just bring it up and I'll, I'll uh, look at it. We have. Now, one thing I want to say is inductive reading is a bunch of rules. You can buy books on inductive reading. It's boring to read rules. When I buy a board game, it comes with a bunch of rules. I don't like to read all those rules. I'd rather start playing the game and reading the rules. Oh, wait a minute. I landed on that square. What's that mean? And then read the rules. So, instead of giving you a bunch of rules to say, this is how you read the Bible inductively, we're going to use the book of John, and we're going to apply rules as they come along. All right? So, did you want to bring up a question? Oh, no, I was just going to pick that. Oh, okay. All right. So, as soon as you have a question, just bring it up, and I'll answer them as we go, because after we move on, we'll have to go back and think about what was I, what was I talking about at that time. All right. Why did John write this gospel? That is a rule in inductive reading know the reason the author had for writing it. John is writing to the common Jew who cannot believe that Jesus is God. So John has to prove that Jesus is God. If I were Jewish, what would that mean to me? Anybody who claims to be God is blasphemous. That is really the worst sin. Now, there are a lot of people who think, I'm Moses, I'm Elijah, I'm one of the prophets. They're just crazy. But if he says he's God, he's blasphemous. Okay? So, John is saying Jesus is God himself. How do you prove that to a Jew who can't get past the idea that you're, you're speaking blasphemy? I don't want to hear this. That's John's problem. John has to prove it to a Jew. Difficult job. Now, some of these Jews came from Nazareth. 
You can't tell me that kid. I saw that kid growing up. He's the carpenter's son. You're trying to tell me he's God? Think of any kid in the neighborhood and somebody telling you that's God. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're out of your mind. So that's what John has to prove. Did you know that all the God, you know, uh, here, here's another thing about where do you start when you're talking to somebody about the Lord and they say, where should I begin reading the Bible? You say, read the Gospels. Or on their own, they're going to start reading from Genesis, right? You always start in the beginning of the book. So you hand him a New Testament, and he's going to start in Matthew. What's in chapter 1 of Matthew? Genealogies. Oh, forget this. You don't want to leave a Bible in front of them and say, start reading. You want to read with them. Now, let's say I'm really interested in becoming a Christian, and I have nobody to help me. I read Matthew, and I, I struggle through Matthew, but then I get to Mark, and I say, oh, this is much easier. Well, wait a minute. I, I know this story. It's about Jesus. Well, I'm glad it's a short gospel. Then I get into Luke. Wait a minute. This is the same story. I know this. Is the entire Bible repetitious? Why, is, why are there four gospels? I told you the purpose of John. What I'm going to tell you now is not in your notes. Each gospel explained to a major argument of why he cannot be who he claims to be. Matthew wrote to educated scholars, Jewish scholars, the Pharisees. What is it the Pharisees say he cannot be? He cannot be the king that's promised from the scriptures. How can he be the king? I've got three arguments to prove that he's not the king. He was born dirt poor. He lived like a tramp. Even Jesus said, I have nowhere to lay my head. And then he died like a criminal. Don't tell me he's the king. How does Matthew prove this? He quotes Old Testament fulfillment of scriptures 50 times. You're the scholar. You're supposed to know these prophecies. Didn't you know Jesus fulfilled this prophecy? Then this prophecy? Then this prophecy? 50 of them. Wow. After reading Matthew, even though I'm a scholar in the scriptures, if I continue to deny that he's the, the king, I'm controlled by Satan. Now, you look at Mark, and it's an easy book. In chapter 1, he's already doing miracles. Mark doesn't spend time in genealogies. Mark gets right into the action. Every chapter in Mark is action, action, action. Miracles, miracles. Jesus is going out of his way to help people. But who's his audience? Mark is writing to the common Gentile. Historical context. What is a Gentile in the first century? He's a pagan. He worships many gods. Name the planets and you've already named eight or nine gods. Right? Okay. What are these gods like? Well, I pray to them and I hope they're awake to hear my prayers. I repeat my prayers just in case they misunderstood me the first time. I shout my prayers just in case they're far away. And I just hope they're on my side. Otherwise, they're going to hurt me. What Mark is trying to show you is Jesus is your servant. He goes out of his way to help you. He loves you. He works for you. He cares. 
The main issue in Mark is God cares about you. Plus that, when you look at all these miracles, he's all powerful. He's more powerful than all the gods of Olympus. And the gods of Olympus, they don't want to help me. Jesus wants to help me. He hears my prayers. He drops everything to go and help me. I don't need these other gods. So, notice the opposite. Matthew is writing about Jesus is king. Mark is saying he's servant. They're opposite. Jesus is both king and servant. Then you come to Luke. Luke is writing to the educated Gentile. Philosophers. A lot of these philosophers have figured out Jesus cannot be our savior. You say he's God. I believe he could be another God. But gods don't die. He's not human. So what do you think Luke is trying to prove? Jesus is human, right? So, in Luke you're going to find all the human emotions. Jesus cried, Jesus uh, got hungry, he got thirsty, he got tired. In every way, he felt all our pain. He was 100% human, and yet without sin. So it speaks to people on a philosophical level. Notice, Matthew wrote to the educated Jew. Luke wrote to the educated Gentile. And then we get back to John. What's John trying to prove? You forgot that Jesus is God. Right. That Jesus is God. And he's writing to the common Jew. Just like Mark writing to the common Gentile. These four arguments cover any aspect about why I deny Jesus as who he claimed to be. That is why you see a repetition. In order to prove their point, they had to write in a certain style. Style is one of the things you want to be aware of when you're reading inductively. Now I'm going to get into John 1. All right. Are there any questions now that I've explained inductive reading and, and given you a little bit, a little, little example of knowing why the author wrote what he wrote? No questions at this time? Okay. I want to encourage you to have questions. If you go home tonight and you think of a question, write it down, bring it back next week. Okay? And another thing, by the way, I put on the top of your notes, Acts 17.11. Who knows Acts 17.11? These Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they studied the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Paul is saying, you know, I, ta I taught the people of Thessalonica. They believed everything I said. But those Bereans, when I spoke in Berea, they, when I said something, they said, wait a minute, let me see if that's really in the Bible. Let me check you out. If it's here, I believe what you said, but wait a minute. You said something I never heard before. Let me check it. I want you to have that attitude. Don't assume that I'm telling you the truth. Don't assume any pastor is telling you the truth. If you hear something different, check the scriptures to see if it's in correct historical context. Inductive reading. That's why inductive reading is so important. Okay?
If you have your Bibles, open to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Word is intangible. We can't see it, we can't touch it, we can't taste it, but it exists. God is a spirit. We cannot see God, we cannot touch God, we cannot taste God, but he exists. Notice that word is capitalized. The concept of word is very difficult for an unchurched person to follow, and yet this is the opening line in John's Gospel. This is puzzling until we get to verse 14. Now, if you can stay with me, I'm talking to the unsaved, the unchurched person. If you can stay with me until we get to verse 14, you'll realize he's saying that the word is Jesus. Verse 14 says the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who became flesh and dwelt among us? Jesus. Okay? But... There are a lot of verses in between 1 and 14, and I'm going to get lost. I'm going to forget about the first verse by the time I get to 14. That's why you've got to explain it to them that it'll, it'll make it clear once it gets down that far, okay? So, when you're thinking about uh, anytime you're reading the book of John, remember you're trying to discover John's argument for Jesus is God. So when we get to verse 14, what does verse 14 tell you? Only God was in the beginning. All right. By the way, there's another clue that John gives us. What happened on day one? God said, let there be light. What became, what, what was before light? What was before light? God's word, God said. In the beginning was the word. God spoke. Even before light existed. Jesus was in the beginning. So, and uh, John will throw in a lot of subtle things in there, and we'll catch them as we read. Verses 2 and 3. He, had, he was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. This tells me that Jesus created all things, the entire cosmos. Well, only God can create. Here's more proof John is telling us. Jesus is God. Only God creates. And God creates from nothing. I can make something. If I have some materials, I can make a mess. But God can start with nothing and make it into something. Considering philosophy, what does uh, the Big Bang Theory teach us? In the beginning there was absolutely nothing, and then nothing exploded into everything. That's... <laughs> That sense? That, that doesn't make sense. But there is no God. Nothing created itself. I think I have, I'd have to have more faith to be an atheist than to trust God's word. Verses 4 and 5. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. 
by the way, the first three chapters of John deal with this issue of darkness and light. Jesus is the light. The world is in darkness. The world has refused to accept the light, and it remains in darkness. That not only applies to the people in these three chapters, it applies to the people 80, 80 years later reading this gospel. Okay? If you guys have a question at any time, raise your hand, and uh, I'll know that a, a written part uh, will be coming to the table. You, you write it down, and then uh, bring it up, and I'll, I'll, I'll cover it. And we know that it'll have to deal with what we've covered so far. While she's doing that, I'm going on to verse 6 through 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now, you're telling the person you're reading the Bible with, stay with me. We were talking about Jesus. Now we're not talking about Jesus. Oh, really? Okay. Stick to one subject. No, John doesn't. He's jumping from Jesus to John. Are we talking about John who wrote this book? No, we're talking about John the Baptist. Okay? And John has a certain ministry. His ministry is the herald. Before a king enters a town, a herald walks in front of him, announcing, Make way for the king! John the Baptist prepared the way for the king's entry. He was a herald. A herald oftentimes has a big horn. But that is his purpose. He precedes the king with trumpets, and he makes this announcement. Our Redeemer <laughs> is the king of kings, and John is his herald. Now, that's the connection between these two. That's why John is bringing, uh, John, the author John is bringing up John the Baptist because Jesus is God. You don't know this yet, but even John the Baptist knew this before he met Jesus. So that is why I'm introducing John at the same time, assuming I'm the author. Okay. Did you did you write it? Thank you. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Is this life referring to the life that we have now? Good question. Now, we already have life, right? So, the gospel is saying you will have eternal life. But, once you've accepted Jesus, you will start to experience the abundant life. Let's not talk about the abundant life right now, because right now, what you know is you're going to die. What's going to happen with you after you die? Most people would say, I don't know. I hope I'm in heaven. Well, John is introducing eternal life, but like I said, once they have the Holy Spirit in them, they will experience the abundant life. Uh, 
Are you satisfied or did you need more? If you have, if you have more questions about this, did you know that uh, evolution is always talking about things evolving, getting better and better, but where did it start? Where did life begin? They can't tell you that. They've tried experiments, but they've always had the doctor the experiment. I could bring you the article on that, but they can't make life appear. It, whatever enzymes they create kill each other. It can't work. So, uh, Jesus brings life. He put life into Adam. He puts life into our dead souls. And he gives us eternal life. So, this is a very good question because he's speaking about life. We switch from the subject of light and dark, lightness and darkness, to life and death. So, both things are brought out in John. Going on to verses 9 to 11. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and through, though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Now we're speaking to the people who are reading this. You're one of the people that didn't receive him. We're talking about God's people did not receive him. They're God's people because they're sons of Abraham. But they didn't receive him. So John is writing, the Apostle John is writing to skeptics. The Pharisees rejected Jesus and the people follow social media like we do today. They follow the word of the scholars, the Pharisees. If they say he's not the Messiah, why should I believe it? They're the brains. They studied the scriptures. So John's writing is opposed to popular opinion. He's going against social media of his time. And to accept Jesus is to become a social outcast. Is it any different today? Are Christians kind of like social outcasts? If you haven't experienced it, you will. The world is becoming more and more hostile. And if you don't remember, think about when it was embarrassing to say Merry Christmas. That was the beginning of feeling like an outcast. Happy holidays, season's greetings, but not Merry Christmas. Remember when they tried to take down the cross in Ventura? Ah, uh, so we are becoming more and more social outcasts. And as we approach the end times, we are in the end times, but as we pro approach the, the, the rapture of the church, we will see it more. It will intensify. This is why we need to learn how to read the scriptures correctly, because people who claim to be Christians are reading it incorrectly through postmodernism. You guys will become missionaries if you can read the scriptures with someone else. So I want you to develop this method of reading scripture. Verses 12 through 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who be, believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision 
or of human uh, husband's will, but born of God. You know what we're talking about? If it's not born of natural descent, if it's not of a human decision, it's an adoption. We are adopted into the family of God. What does that mean in historical context? These people who are reading this live in the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, adoption was a special honor. The adopted child would replace the biological child as heir of all my things. I have this idiot son here who I don't trust with any of my fortune. So I've been watching that kid over there. He doesn't have parents. His father died in the war. You know, a lot of Roman soldiers leave their kids behind. Son, you want to be my heir? You're my, you're my son now. My other son, he's not my son. Go away. This is the adoption. Jews are descendants of Abraham. But they rejected Jesus. We, I don't know if any of you are Jewish, but we have accepted Jesus and we have been adopted into his family. We will inherit all that belongs to Jesus. They won't. It falls right in line with historical context, doesn't it? If you understand Roman Empire laws, wow, this makes sense to any Jew. They rejected the creator of the universe. Verse, then we finally get to verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. How have we seen God's glory through Jesus? Did Jesus ever sin? No, of course not. And the Pharisees have been watching him like a hawk. They've been watching every move he made. So, you don't think that kid that you grew up with is God? Tell me, did you ever see him sin? Wow. Another thing. Did he understand the scriptures? The scholars argued with him. They tried to prove he didn't understand scriptures. He made fools out of them. Only God has that kind of glory. Right? We've only read 14 verses. And John is coming out very strong with his argument that Jesus is God. 15. John testified concerning him. He cried out saying, This is the one I spoke about when I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. <clears throat> now, if you have a Catholic background, you are familiar with what Elizabeth said when she met Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, right? And then what happened? John kicked. She was pregnant with John the Baptist, and he kicked. You see, John the Baptist was about six months older than Jesus. But John is saying, he was before me. Jesus existed before I was conceived. Because John knows he was from the beginning. He had no creator. So we have John's testimony about this. Verses 16 through 18. Any other questions? 
people are writing down? Okay. Verses 16 through 18. Out of his fullness we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. Now, the Ten Commandments was God's standard for righteousness. If you can keep the Ten Commandments, you have no sin. If you can keep the Ten Commandments, you don't have to physically die because you are pure. But if you break just one of the commandments, it's the same as breaking all of them because sin must be judged. Even if it's just one, of course, I haven't met anybody who could say, I only broke one. <laughs> but if that were true, I'd still be punishable. So, we are sinners, and the consequence for sin is hell. The Ten Commandments is there to prove that salvation cannot be earned. Our Redeemer has to bring God's grace to us, because you can't work for it. Here comes a big section, 19 through 28. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, he said, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. Now the Pharisees, who had been sent, questioned him. Why then do you baptize, if you are not the Messiah or Elijah, nor the prophet, well, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. Do you realize what I just read? The priests interrogated John because he was baptizing people. They were in terror. This was an inquisition. Jewish baptism was a purification ceremony. Jews were baptized before becoming rabbis. You know, when you're baptized, you die to your old life and you come up to serve the Lord, right? Before you go into ministry, you go through this cleansing baptism and come up as a man who serves God and will deliver his message as a rabbi. So Jews were baptizing long before Christians. Well, John, who gave you that authority? You're not a priest. So they asked him loaded questions. Are you Elijah? What did I say about people who think they're Elijah or Moses? They're crazy. Well, are you the prophet? No. Who is the prophet? That would be God. So, he's not crazy. Well, then who are you? I'm just a voice in the wilderness letting you know he's here. Well, that's not enough to disqualify him. I came here to get him to say something that would say, hey, you're no, longer, you're no longer qualified to baptize people. Keep your mouth shut. He didn't say anything that could disqualify him. So they left him alone.
where does John get this authority? He's announcing the arrival of God. Wouldn't God have chosen me, a priest? I mean, I'm more qualified to announce the arrival of the Messiah. But John, what is John? He's not a priest. He's a bug-eating vagrant. He eats locusts. He's dressed in camel hair. I, I can't understand why God would tell him about the approach of God. You know, <laughs> doesn't make sense. And so they were going to disqualify him. Question here, what does John's, uh, John's baptism mean? Oh, he's telling everybody, prepare the way, the God is coming. He's on the earth right now. We've been praying for him to come, but he's here now. Someday you're going to see him face to face. Get your path straight. Start walking with God. I mean, make an extra effort to walk with God. So in front of all these witnesses, I am going to be baptized. Same reason. To come up to say, as, a, as, a, as you, you are my witnesses, that from here on I walk with God. Okay? So they're not going into ministry to be rabbis. But they are going to walk right because God is here. They believe God is here and they want to they start living. They probably were already living for God, but now it's intentional. Now it's in my mind because I might be walking right into him and he might be watching me yelling at my wife. So I have to really be careful. And sometimes uh, I, I might be angry at my children for the wrong reason. And uh, I don't want Jesus to see that. So I'm going to really try hard. Okay. And uh, Jesus had to get baptized. He didn't have to get baptized. His life wasn't going to change. I mean, he was pure before and he was pure after, right? But they interrogated John the Baptist. You think they're going to interrogate Jesus if he went through all the hoops? Hey, you didn't get your baptism before getting into this ministry as rabbi. You're disqualified. He, he, he met all the requirements of man as well as God. But... Even John said, why am I baptizing you? To fulfill the law. So, okay. In your notes, I have, in conclusion, a review. What inductive reading skills did you learn today? Keep in mind the author's purpose for writing the gospel. John's purpose was to prove that Jesus is divine. He is God. Remember John's writing style. John, oh, I didn't cover this, but he's not writing in chronological order. You will see this as we cover the first three chapters. This was written in approximately uh, about 50 years after the crucifixion of Jesus. What should, what should you look for when reading the book of John? Now, this is one thing I want, as you're reading each chapter, I want you to ask yourself, who could have done these things? Only God can do these things. Or who could have known that information? Only God knows that kind of information. Who can talk like that? Only God can talk like that. Uh... Or look at his divine attributes. It shows he's omniscient. He knows everything. Or he's all-powerful. 
know, different qualities of God. You'll see that. And uh, as we go, I will put a number besides these in that order. I'll say, notice here, number one, number four, number three. That's what John proved. Again, John is showing he is God. Here's, my, here's one of my uh, proofs. Now, again, why are we learning this? This is witnessing information. If you're going to use this, usually people are not looking for God unless they are suffering. Okay? If things are going fine, I'm not looking for God. Usually people will not read the Bible unless a friend is willing to read it with them. This is what I'm preparing you to do. To be a friend and read scriptures with someone. Find a young believer or someone who is suffering and establish a relationship. That's the important thing. You have to have a relationship. You don't go up to a stranger and say, hey, would you like to read scripture with me? Forget it. I don't know you. But if you have a relationship, oh, you were reading that? I remember reading that, and this is what I remember, what I got from it. And then you say, oh, did you read a little further? And then you're starting to read with them, and they say, oh, wow, that, I didn't read far enough. Okay, So that's how you establish a relationship with them. And the person you establish a relationship with could be somebody in your family, especially if you have children. If you have somebody who's uh, in bed, like uh, elderly, uh, they, they are perfect to be reading scripture with. Ask them about uh, basic questions about their faith, but only as the Holy Spirit leads. You're not trying to embarrass them, but if you really feel that there's something burdening them, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, to bring up a certain subject, then with sensitivity, bring it up. But only if you feel the Holy Spirit leading you. Then study the Bible together. That's what this course is all about. And remember I said people are not looking for God unless they're suffering? Secretly, I'm preparing you for a prison ministry. Once we're all arrested as Christians, you've got an audience. Okay, so let's close in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you will help us to develop the skills of reading the scripture in historical context so that we can have the, the appropriate application to our lives. And when people say, doesn't the Bible contradict itself when it says this? By knowing the historical context, we can say, no, it supports this. And so, Lord, teach us to love your word because we understand it more. In the name of Christ, amen. amen. Any other questions? If you're... If you're at home and there was something from today's lesson that you thought really was important, write it down as a test question and see if somebody can answer that for next week. Do that every week. And uh, hopefully I can answer it. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome.